Imagine it's 1899, and you are an intelligent, educated person who's been able to get into some of the finest schools in the land where you were trained by some of the great professors in what's known as the new psychology. But also imagine that you're a woman. You've already faced so many obstacles in your education and career progression, like not being treated as a real student, and having to choose between being a parent or a professor. And now you finally arrived as a full-fledged PhD, but this is what stops you, a cigar. Yes, a cigar. As a woman, you're not allowed to smoke a cigar, at least among mixed company. Therefore, you're gonna be excluded from a lot of important meetings with leading men in the field. In this video, I will tell you the story of three women in psychology who faced these obstacles and somehow overcame them to make important contributions. And at the end of the video, I'll tell you more about the cigar requirement. For at least 100 years, you could argue well into the 1960s, women were not given equal access to higher education as students and as academics. There were three main reasons behind this, each reflecting deep-seated sexist beliefs about women. The first belief was called the periodic function, and this was the belief that women were intellectually incapacitated every month during menstruation. So yes, people actually believed that women were impaired when they had their periods. Second, many scientists, including prominent people in psychology today, like Steven Pinker, have argued what's been known as the variability hypothesis. Men show more variability in their distribution of intelligence, so their curve is spread out more than women's abilities. This would mean that the brightest men would always be more intelligent than the most brilliant women. And the third belief was that women had the capacity to be only wives and mothers or teachers and academics. It was impossible to have it all and getting married meant you automatically were ineligible to be hired as a university professor. Of course, this didn't happen to men. This was, for example, the case at my university, the University of Queensland, which didn't remove this rule until well after World War II. So these three beliefs caused many barriers for women who wanted to get an advanced education. Despite these barriers, some opportunities arose in the second half of the 19th century, and part of this was because colleges and universities started allowing women to become students. At first, the things that they were taught were home economics. So that is, they were meant to come to the university or the college to learn how to sew, be a good cook, raise children. But later on, they decided that women needed to be teachers because as they started having compulsory education across the United States and elsewhere, they needed to educate women to become teachers to fill the gap. And so they opened up colleges and training schools just for women so they could learn to become teachers. Ivy League schools like Harvard and Yale resisted the efforts to have women enrolled at their particular colleges, so they compromised by creating women's schools affiliated with the men's, such as the Harvard Annex, which later became Radcliffe College. But the best opportunities for women came with creating a new educational phenomenon, and these were elite colleges in the U.S. that were created for women only, such as Vassar College in 1865. Matthew Vassar endowed this college because, quote, it occurred to me that woman, having received from her creator the same intellectual constitution as man, has the same right as man to intellectual culture and development. That's very progressive of him. Other colleges were similarly set up by philanthropists like Smith in 1871, Wellesley in 1875, and Bryn Mawr in 1885. By 1901, 119 of these women's colleges were in the United States. So now you had all these young women enrolling in these colleges as they were opening up, but who would teach those women students? It seemed more appropriate at a women's college that women would be the teachers or the professors. So that required that women would have to go and get PhDs or some sort of advanced training so they could teach at these different women's colleges. So that's actually where these three women come up, Christine Ladd Franklin, Mary Calkins, and Margaret Floyd Washburn. Christine Ladd lived from 1847 to 1930. She was born in Connecticut, and during her early childhood, she lived with her parents. Her dad was a merchant, and she had a younger brother, Henry. She also had a sister. The family correspondence shows that the mother and her sisters were all staunch supporters of women's rights, even at a young age. Before she celebrated her fifth birthday, her mother took her to a lecture by Elizabeth Oak Smith, 
a well-known proponent of women's rights. Additionally, her father was a graduate professor who supported Christine's efforts. Christine was a precocious child who sought to find a means to continue her education beyond secondary school. Her wish was granted in 1865 when her father enrolled her in a two-year program at a co-educational academy in Massachusetts, where she took the same courses that prepared boys planning to go to Harvard. She graduated from there as the valedictorian and made the decision to pursue further education at Vassar College. In 1866, she went off to the new Vassar based on a loan from her aunt. However, due to financial issues, she only studied at Vassar until the end of the spring term. During the time that she wasn't attending college, she worked as a public school teacher until her aunt's funds allowed her to re-enter Vassar and graduate in 1869. While attending Vassar, she began working under the mentorship of an astronomy professor, a woman named Maria Mitchell, who was famous for having been the first woman to discover a new comet using a telescope in 1847. Mitchell was also a suffragette, and she strove to inspire women to gain more self-confidence in order to succeed in male-dominated fields during this period. Under Mitchell's guidance, she blossomed and quickly developed a love for the fields of physics and mathematics. Since women in the 19th century were not allowed in physics laboratories, Christine could not pursue her first love of physics and chose instead to study mathematics. Later in life, she reflected on this decision and said that, had it not been for the impossibility in those days of women obtaining access to laboratory facilities, she would have eagerly gone on to study physics. In 1878, she was accepted into Johns Hopkins University with the help of James Sylvester, an English mathematician who remembered some of her earlier works. Her application for the university fellowship was signed C. Ladd, and Hopkins offered the fellowship to her without realizing she was a woman. When they did realize this, the board moved to revoke the offer, but Sylvester insisted that Ladd should be his student, and so she was. She held a fellowship at Hopkins for three years, but the trustees did not allow her name to be printed in the circulars with those of the other fellows for fear of setting a precedent. There was so much dissension in her continued presence in the classes. It forced one of the original trustees of Johns Hopkins to resign. Since Johns Hopkins did not really approve of co-education, she was initially allowed only in classes that were taught by Sylvester. But after displaying exceptional work in his courses, she was allowed to take courses with different professors. From 1879 to 1880, she took classes with Charles Sanders Pierce, who has been called the first philosopher psychologist. She wrote her dissertation on the algebra of logic, with Pierce as her thesis advisor. Since women were not allowed to graduate from Hopkins, she was refused her PhD, although she was the first woman to complete all the requirements for her PhD at Hopkins. Hopkins eventually got around to granting her a PhD in 1927, 44 years after she had earned it when she was now 70. In 1884, she married a fellow class member, Fabian Franklin, who got his PhD in mathematics, and so she became Christine Ladd-Franklin, she had two children, one of whom died in infancy. Her surviving daughter, Margaret Ladd Franklin, became a prominent women's suffrage movement member. Christine herself often wrote of this injustice that she observed in female oppression. In 1893, Christine applied for a teaching position at Johns Hopkins, but she was denied, and despite the setback, she remained persistent. She never could secure a regular academic position there or anywhere else because she was married and had a child. Women who were fortunate enough to obtain academic positions in universities at that time often chose them despite their lack of compensation. So Christine was no different from that. Many of the teaching positions she held were on a volunteer basis, creating a substantial financial strain on her and her family. But she placed a high value on all of this, and so she became a successful contributor to the field. One of her major contributions to psychology was her theory of color vision, which was based on evolutionary theory. Ladd Franklin noted that some animals are colorblind and assumed that achromatic vision appeared first in evolution and that color vision must have come later. She assumed further that the human eye carries fragments of its earlier evolutionary development. She observed that the most highly evolved part of the eye is the fovea, where visual acuity and color sensitivity are the greatest. She assumed that peripheral vision, which was provided by the rods of the retina, was more primitive than foveal vision because night vision and movement detection were crucial for survival. Now, I also will mention more about her battle with cigars and one of the leaders of psychology at that time, Titchener, later in this video. My next story is about Mary Culkins, 
who lived from 1860 to 1930. Calkins was the oldest of five children. She grew up in Buffalo, New York, where her father was a Protestant minister. In 1881, the family moved to Newton, Massachusetts, and after she completed high school, she attended Smith College, a woman's college, and graduated there in 1885. Shortly after her graduation, she accompanied her family on a year-long vacation in Europe. After she came back, she was offered a position at Wellesley College, which is just west of Boston, where she was offered to teach Greek. And there she began her 40-year affiliation at Wellesley. After she had been there for about a year, the college decided that they would like a woman to start teaching experimental psychology. They didn't find any women available on the job market who could teach psychology, so they decided to arrange the training for Calkins because of her success as a teacher and because she was also interested in psychology. So they gave her this appointment to study experimental psychology for one year, catching up on what was happening. This posed a problem because none of the nearby institutions would accept women as graduate students at the time. She contacted the philosopher Josiah Royce and William James at Harvard, and she sought permission to attend their seminars. And both Royce, a philosopher, and, and James, a psychologist, said, yes, you can come to our seminars. But the president of Harvard, Charles Eliot, said no. But after intense lobbying by Royce and James and Culkin's father, Eliot changed his position and allowed Culkin's to attend these graduate seminars at Harvard. He stipulated, however, that she attend without being officially enrolled as a Harvard student. He was concerned that her official enrollment would open the door to co-education at Harvard, which he strongly opposed. When it became known that Calkins would be attending James's seminar, all the male students in William James's seminar promptly withdrew from the course, presumably in protest. I mean, literally every male in the seminar just quit the class, leaving her alone as the only student in the seminar with James. And James had just published his Principles of Psychology in 1890. Forty years later, Calkins remembered this experience. She wrote, I began the serious study of psychology with William James. Most unhappily for them, and most fortunately for me, the other members of his seminar in psychology dropped away in the early weeks of the fall of 1890, and James and I were left at either side of a library fire. The principles of psychology was warm for the press, and my absorbed study of those brilliant, erudite, and provocative volumes as interpreted by their writer was my introduction to psychology. That's just such an amazing story, given how much she had gone through in order to learn about psychology. And she ended up getting the master himself alone right after his book was published. Anyway, while Calkins was attending these seminars at Harvard, she was also doing laboratory work at Clark University under the supervision of Edmund Sanford, who later became the president of the American Psychological Association. And this too was done by special arrangement. She did research on dreams for her degree and under Sanford's supervision. She presented at the first annual APA meeting in December of 1892 and published in a journal in 1893. She also published a paper on the association of ideas that was stimulated by her work in James's seminar. In the fall of 1891, she returned to Wellesley where she established a psychology laboratory, the first in a women's college, and introduced experimental psychology into the curriculum. After about a year, she needed to continue her formal education, so she returned to Harvard again as a non-registered student. By now, though, James had moved on to philosophy full-time, and Hugo Munsterberg had taken over the psychology laboratory. He later became an important person in industrial and organizational psychology. But when she came back, Hugo Munsterberg was now running the laboratory, and so she continued to do her work with him. She was two months older than him and got along very well with Munsterberg, and she was also fluent in German. So that really helped because he didn't speak much English when he first arrived. He remained her mentor and advocate for many years. Strangely, they shared the same view of professional women. Both Calkins and Munsterberg believed that the primary female role in society was to be a mother and wife. In fact, Calkins pitied and condemned women who declined marriage to pursue a career. She also disavowed feminism, believing that it was incompatible with the family. She said, quote, wherein feminism makes encroachments into the institution of the family, I cannot follow, unquote. And Munsterberg agreed with the exception of the cases of a few exceptional women who should pursue careers instead of motherhood, presumably like Calkins. So they held the belief of women in academia that women really didn't belong there. They shouldn't be doing science. They should be at home being mothers and wives. Here's Calkin's lab at Wellesley, and this is what the apparatus looked like. I don't really understand what the masks are for, 
must have something to do with facial expressions, but you can see there are a bunch of different things there that are very strange. Now, while she was working with Munsterberg, she did do original research on the factors influencing memory. And during this research, she invented the still widely used paired associate technique that she could use to study the influence of frequency, recency, and vividness on memory. For example, she would show her subjects a series of colors paired with numbers. Later, after several paired presentations, the colors alone were presented, and the subjects were asked to recall the corresponding numbers. And among other things, Calkins found that the frequency of occurrence facilitated memory more than the recency or vividness did. Now finally, my third story is about Margaret Floy Washburn, who lived from 1871 to 1939. She was born in New York City. She was raised in Harlem by her father Francis, an Episcopal priest, and her mother Elizabeth Floyd, who came from a prosperous New York family. Margaret was an only child. She did not appear to have childhood companions her age and spent much of her time with adults or reading. She learned to read long before she started school. This caused her to advance quickly when she started school. At the age of seven, she learned French and German, and then she graduated from high school at the age of 15, and that fall she entered Vassar College. She was only admitted as a preparatory student there because she hadn't taken enough Latin or French. And during this time, she developed a strong interest in philosophy through poetry and other literary works. In her final years at Vassar, she was introduced to psychology and she graduated in 1891. Washburn became determined to study under James McKean Cattell and his new psychological laboratory at Columbia. But Columbia would not admit women as graduate students, so she was only admitted as an auditor of the class. Cattell treated her as a normal student and became her first mentor. She attended his seminars and lectures and worked in his laboratory alongside the men, but received no formal credit for her work. At the end of her first year of admission at Columbia, Cattell encouraged her to transfer to the newly organized Sage School of Philosophy at Cornell University to obtain her PhD. Washburn was accepted in 1892 as one of the first Sage School students with a scholarship to go to Cornell. At Cornell, she studied under Edward Bradford Titchener, who joined the Sage School about then and became his first and only major graduate student at the time. As a graduate student, she conducted an experimental study of the methods of equivalencies and tactile perception. This was suggested by her advisor Titchener after two semesters of experimental psychology. She subsequently earned her master's degree from Vassar in absentia in the late spring of 1893. During that time, she started working on another master's thesis, which was done on visual imagery. In June of 1894, Washburn gave her oral presentation and became the first woman to receive a PhD in psychology from Cornell with Titchener as her advisor. Washburn was also elected to the newly established American Psychological Association. Her master's dissertation was sent by Titchener to Wilhelm Wundt, who translated it and published it in his German Philosophical Studies in 1895. Following her graduation, she was offered the Chair of Psychology, Philosophy, and Ethics at Wells College in Aurora, New York, which is near Cornell. She accepted the offer and spent the next six years there. While she was there, she would make sure to visit Cornell to catch up with her friends and work in the laboratories. She also took brief appointments at Cornell and the University of Cincinnati after that. In the spring of 1903, she returned to Vassar College as an associate professor in philosophy, where she remained the rest of her life. Remember that she could only have all these appointments because she never married. Shortly after Washburn started working at Vassar, she became the head of the newly founded psychology department. She treated her students well, and they appreciated her as a professor. A large number of her students continued to advance in the field of psychology. After graduation, she published many of her students' studies. During her career, the students would collect and work with the data while she wrote up and published the experiments. Between the years 1905 and 1938, Washburn published 68 studies from the Vassar Undergraduate Laboratory. These studies were the largest series of studies from any American university at the time. At one point, her students gifted her with a large sum of money and they wanted her to use it for leisure. Instead, she used the money as a scholarship aid to help students in the psychology department. Washburn also published a book on comparative psychology called The Animal Mind. In 1908, she had her own motor theory of consciousness that was akin to some of William James's ideas about motor movements and cognition. Washburn became the president of the American Psychological Association in 1922 
and also gained membership to the National Academy of Sciences in 1931. I've told the stories of these three women at this particular time because they were contemporaries and they faced a lot of the same obstacles. But I wanted to end the video by talking to you again about some of these problems with people like Titchener. It's interesting that Titchener was Margaret Floyd Washburn's advisor, right? In fact, Titchener supervised the PhD degrees of 21 women throughout his career. But Titchener and his colleagues would never allow women to join the club of elite psychologists. Thus, women were always excluded from all sorts of important networks of scientific psychologists. For example, here in 1909 is a special meeting when Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung came to meet the psychologists of America, and yet there's not a single woman standing in this photograph because they weren't allowed to participate, even though there would have been many women who could have been invited. And by the way, you can see Titchener there. He's in the front row, second person from the left. So he got to show up, but women were not allowed to come. Titchener himself started his own special group, the Experimentalists, in 1904, and only men were allowed to join. And part of the reason, he argued, was that he and the other men would get together and smoke cigars at their meetings, and women were not supposed to smoke cigars. And so he believed banning women would allow these men of science to relax more, have more creative ideas, and get to smoke cigars and talk about psychology without compunction to behave in a particular way. Some historians have reported that women would sometimes sneak into these meetings and hide under the table so they could listen to the discussion of the men, and then they could keep up with what was going on. You can see in this picture of the experimentalist meeting in 1916 that several of the men are holding cigars for the group photo, and that's Titchener off to the left. Christine Ladd Franklin regularly tried to join the experimentalists and often confronted Titchener about his men's club. The most dramatic of these run-ins happened when the experimentalists were going to meet at Columbia University in 1914, where Ladd Franklin was teaching a course. One of the key topics on the agenda of that meeting was color vision, which Ladd Franklin was the world authority. She wrote to Titchener the following in a letter. Is this a good time for you to hold the medieval attitude of not admitting me to your coming psychological conference at my very door? So unconscientious, so immoral, worse than that, so unscientific. Both the psychological and philosophical associations have long admitted women to their smokers and everything. I smoke. I should be very unfashionable if I didn't. It is only this acute thinking and disgusting little organization of yours, which seems to be so sadly dominated by you, which still holds out. So medieval, such an indignity. Well meant, I know, you've told me so, but such a mistake in kindness. Do quickly repent, and you need me. Titchener did not repent, and Ladd Franklin asked James McKean Cattell, the meeting's Columbia host, to take her as his guest, which he did. The members apparently begrudgingly allowed her to attend the discussions on color vision. After Titchener's death, Margaret Washburn and the other women were admitted, but Ladd Franklin was never invited to join. The experimentalists kept meeting every year. Here's another photo of another meeting in 1927 at the University of Pennsylvania. You can see some of them holding on to their cigars. Titchener is the guy in the middle there with a big white beard. Here's another picture of that group, now known as the Society of Experimental Psychologists in 1935 at Yale University. And finally, there's a woman in the picture, Margaret Floyd Washburn, seated in the second row, fourth from the left. Titchener is not in this photo because he had passed away by this point. The Society of Experimental Psychologists is still around. It's considered a very prestigious organization. You have to be voted in to join this club. As it says on their webpage in the third paragraph, the meetings are plenary and involve papers from various members of the society. The society currently admits at least six new members annually from among the leading experimentalists in North America. So they have to come from North America. It has a current membership of 281 individuals, about five to 10% of the practicing experimental psychologists. So in a way, what they're saying is they're only taking the cream of the crop. If women are not allowed to join this very exclusive club for decades, you can see how that would have had a negative impact on how psychology progressed in all these different universities. In fact, if you look at the different photos of the SCP over the decades, you very rarely ever see a woman, or for that matter, a person of color. It's not really until you get to this century that you regularly see women. Here's a picture from 2005, and if you look carefully there, you can see maybe seven women that are in the picture, but most of them, again, are males. Then in 2015, they have a few more women here. 
I thought it was kind of funny that two of the guys didn't make the photo, so they just cut and pasted their pictures in. But again, there's just a handful of women. I think this photo from 2018 looks more promising. You can see here that there are many more women in the club now, and perhaps they're now getting close to equity. But again, it's been a long time since Titchener originally had this as a group of guys hanging around with their cigars and the women having to wait and hide underneath the tables in order to catch on what the conversations were about. I'll leave you here with a quote from Christine Ladd Franklin, who kept a journal throughout most of her life, and she also gave speeches. Here she is giving a speech in 1904 about why there should be endowed professorships for women at different universities. What she's doing is complaining a bit about the fact that women were still not allowed to have jobs at top universities. That is the case with our clever girls. They go to Germany and get the parchments, beautifully signed and sealed, that proclaim them to be doctors of philosophy, but no further consequences follow. They have nothing but the empty satisfaction of exhibiting their tickets. So they go off to these European universities and get PhDs in physics or chemistry or whatever it is, and they come back to America and they can't get a job at one of the top universities because they're a woman or maybe just because they're married. And that's how Christine Ladd Franklin talked about it in 1904. So what do you think about these three women and what they had to go through? I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. I hope you'll leave a comment below. And if you like this video and you like maybe some other videos like this, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and give this video a like. Appreciate it very much. Until I see you next time and I talk to you about other psychology topics, stay curious. Bye.